Father, we pause just one more time quietly. We've been praying in song, and now I want to pray in this moment and acknowledge that we are fragile and we do, we do want to, to say to all of our fears and anxieties, goodbye. And I pray that whether it's ISIS and the beheadings of 12 Assyrians and the killing of another American aid worker, or whether it's Ebola, or whether it's the collapse of any kind of moral consensus in our land so that we glory in our shame, or whether it's a a marriage being stretched to the breaking point this morning, or whether children who are acting in ways that are inexplicable to us, or whether it's cancer, or whether it's job conflict, Lord, I pray that right now our anxieties would be bidden goodbye in the presence of the massive truth of the centrality of Jesus in history and in the gospel and in our lives. And I pray that that would be exalted, would be seen and loved this morning. So come and help me to that end, I pray, through Christ. Amen. So what I would like to happen, by God's grace, through His Spirit and His Word, is for you to see, perhaps more clearly than you have before, and feel with greater intensity than you may have before, the truth that the gospel is the apex or the supreme expression of the grace of God. And by gospel, I mean the events of the death and the resurrection of Jesus for sinners. That that is the supreme expression of the grace of God. And the grace of God is the supreme expression of the glory of God and the display and communication of the glory of God in the world is the supreme purpose of God in all of history and all that he does for the everlasting enjoyment of his people. So that's the sequence I want you to grasp. Gospel, grace, glory, joy. And at the center of the gospel is Christ, crucified for sinners. And and one of the ways, I believe, that the gospel assumes its centrality in our own ministry and life is for it to assume a centrality in history for us so that our, our efforts to in our little, little teeny life, a little teeny individual life or family life or work life or city life, our little, little life trying to make Christ see Christ as central, we, we would open our eyes and see from eternity to eternity, he is central. In the middle of everything from the Middle East to Ebola to family crises to political collapse, Everything Christ is absolutely supreme and central. Because sometimes just, just to, to, to work at making him central in my family, it doesn't work that way. We, we need to find ourselves caught up, caught up out of ourselves into something majestic. Something way, way bigger than me, or this church, or this city, or this state, or this nation, or this little world. So much bigger. So that's where we're going. I want to talk about the centrality of Christ and the gospel in history 
for the sake of its centrality in my ministry, your ministry. And by ministry, if you hear me use the word ministry, don't think pastorate, think parenting, (laughs) job, coaching the little league team, think... This is what I do. My life is a service. My life is just laid down for his glory, all of life, ministry. So don't limit that word when you hear me talk about gospel-centered or Christ-centered ministry. So let me create a picture for you by distinguishing what I mean by center. If I say center, a lot of you probably would think circle with a center. That's not in my mind. I could preach that sermon. I have preached that sermon. That life is like the solar system. The gospel is like the sun. Its massive brightness makes everything beautiful. And its gravity holds everything in place in life. Great, great sermon. I love that sermon. That's not this sermon. I'm I'm thinking about a line, not a circle. All right? So get a line in your head. A line. And the line stretches to eternity past. And the line stretches to eternity future. It's the line of reality. It's the line of history. And it goes back forever and forward forever. And I'm saying that at the center of that line, and I know that all of you mathematicians are going to have a problem with this because, because the center of an eternal line is, is probably a non, doesn't make any sense. But it really does for us ordinary people. It really does. So just deal with it. (laughs) I know that two halves of eternity are both eternal and therefore the middle. At the middle of this line of history is Christ crucified and risen. Now I want to just put Bible on that for you so you feel the force of what I mean. This is no small thing. We Christians are not a, into a tribal religion. Like we have our little view of things and the Muslims have their little view of things and the Hindus have their little view of things and the Buddhists and the seculars, the New Agers and, and everybody has their little view of things and we enjoy ours and they enjoy theirs. This is totally not the way Christians think. This is a line of reality that everybody is on. All reality is on this line, and Jesus is at the center of it. Exalted at the center, and the gospel is at the center of it because the greatest expression of the grace of God, of the glory of God, for the enjoyment of all his people of all time is the cross of Christ in the gospel, Jesus crucified and risen. So that's, that's the picture I want you to have in your mind. Everything on this line past, before the gospel, before Christ came, was designed to lead toward it and prepare for it, including everything that was going on in God's mind in eternity. And everything after the cross and the resurrection, this this gospel events at the center, everything after it, absolutely everything that happens in the universe on this line is made possible by the cross. If you view it as something happening for the sake of of the glory of God in the people of God for their everlasting joy, which is why it exists. That's a pretty radical statement. Everything happening in the world today can only happen as it is happening for the designs and purposes for which God has prepared it can only happen because Jesus died and rose again. And I'll try to show you what I mean by that and why that's so. But that, those are the two halves we need to deal with. So we've got two exegetical Bible interpretation tasks in front of us. Where do you see in the Bible that everything before Christ is going there? And where do you see in the Bible that everything coming after Christ was made possible by that? Where, where do you see that? Because if you could... Feel that with me. 
then Christ would become bigger for you. He would be more majestic, more great, more glorious, more central in every way for your little life. And your little life just might be caught up into something very, very significant. So let's take task number one, the before the cross. So I I told them I was going to preach on Ephesians 1. So here we are at Ephesians 1. It's actually just one of many texts. So if you have your Bibles and you want to look at this with me, and I suggest if you have a Bible, you do, because I'm going to pick out some pretty important details here that it would be helpful for you to see. So Ephesians chapter 1, I'm going to read verses 4 and 4 through 6. God chose us in him, in Christ, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. So, the beginning of verse 6, it says that election, predestination, adoption is to something. It's going somewhere. There's a reason. There's a purpose. Why did God do election? Why did God do predestination? Why does God do adoption? Answer, to the praise of the glory of his grace. To the praise of the glory of his grace. So, grace, I know your version may have to the praise of his glorious grace, make an adjective out of it. That's okay. Um, literally, it's to the praise of the glory of His grace. So, grace is what's being praised. And what's amazing about grace is that it's the most glorious aspect of God's spillover. So, so grace is the apex, the supreme expression of glory. And we're praising it so it is for our joy. Because you don't know, praise what you don't enjoy. If you try to praise what you don't enjoy, there's a name for that. Hypocrisy. Praise is the overflow of joy in the greatness of God's grace. So, to the praise of the glory of His grace is why all that was happening. Why there was election. Why there was predestination. Why he has adopted sinners into his divine family. So that his glorious grace would be enjoyed forever. And the joy would spill over in praise. So that's that's pretty clear, I think, from verse 4 through 6. And the question is this. What does that have to do with the gospel? What does that have to do with Jesus? Because in the last minute, I didn't mention him. Grace, glory, praise, joy, purpose of election, purpose of predestination, purpose of adoption. Jesus! Gospel! Okay, so let's see the answer to that with three specific phrases in verses 4 through 6. Number f- verse 4. Even as God chose us in Him before the foundation of the world. So election before the foundation of the world, the choosing of a people for Himself is in relation to Jesus. God elects sinners before the foundation of the world. 
Which is why they must be elect in Jesus. Because they're going to praise the glory of grace. And grace means they're getting lots of good things and they don't deserve any of them. That's what grace means. So God is electing sinners for everlasting joy. You can't do that. <coughs> you can't do that. A holy God cannot do that. That's evil. Unless there's gospel, unless there's Christ, unless there's the death, unless there's the substitute, unless there's the propitiation, unless there's the redemption, and all that's in him, in him. So there's my first clue, that this is all related to the gospel. This is all related to Christ crucified. Even as God chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Here's number two, verse five. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ. So, predestination of the chosen unto grace and glory is through Jesus Christ. It had to be through Jesus Christ predestination of sinners unto glory would be wicked if there were no Christ through whom they could be justified. So, they are chosen, now they're predestined through Jesus Christ. Here's number three. Uh... The end of verse 6. To the praise of the glory of his grace with which he blessed us in the beloved. We're getting grace, right? To the praise of the glory of his grace with which he blessed us. Grace upon grace is coming to us. How so? with which he blessed us in the beloved. So we've seen it three times now. We've seen in the beloved in verse 6. We've seen in him in verse 4. And we've seen through Jesus Christ in verse 5. And so my summary, conclusion from those verses is that God's eternal purpose, and I say eternal because it says he chose us before the foundation of the world. So there's no universe yet, just God. And God's thinking of you in your sin, your fallenness, and he chooses you. Through Jesus Christ, in him, in the beloved. Which says this. God's purpose for creation and for history is that it flow to the gospel. It's all planned. We've already been chosen for grace as sinners in Christ. So Christ must come. And everything must prepare for that because that's the way the whole thing has been designed. It's been designed for that. So that's my first text to show that things leading up to it from eternity are pointing there, preparing for that at the center. Now, let's go to two other passages to confirm what we've seen. It's always helpful once you see something in a text and starts to excite you to check your own fallibility, not the text's fallibility, but your fallibility by seeing, is it taught elsewhere like that? So the first one I'll look at with you is 2 Timothy 1.9. So why don't you turn to 2 Timothy 1.9 with me. God saved us. 
2 Timothy 1.9. God saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. We are saved. How so? By works, by things we do to show ourselves worthy? No, but because of his purpose and grace. It's not works, it's grace. If it were not by grace, it'd be by works. If it's by works, it's not by grace. Romans 11, 5. But here it's God's own purpose and grace. And then he says this off-the-charts thing that hardly anybody ever says. This grace that comes to us in our need for justification, our need for righteousness, our need for forgiveness, was given to us in Christ before the universe existed. That's amazing. It, it, it makes something significant out of you, by the way. <laughs> Like, whoa, he gave me grace billions of years ago? Before there were anything called years? And he did it specifically in relation to Jesus Christ. So, confirmation that at the center of reality, created reality here, flowing on this line of history is Jesus Christ, planned from eternity to die and rise again, to display grace to a people who've been chosen, who are sinners and need grace. It's all the plan. That's the plan. That's the reason for it all. ISIS is not the reason. Ebola is not the reason. Politics is not the reason. That's just child's play. It's got to be dealt with. That's not the point of the story. You're the point of the story. Christ exalted in his people who are praising the glory of grace is the point of the story. Here's a second confirmation. In the book of Revelation... Chapter 13, verse 8. We get this strange verse. The beast is on the horizon. Antichrist. And it says this, Revelation 13, 8. All who dwell on the earth will worship it, the beast. Everyone? Well, no, not everyone. And then he, he gives an exception. Who, who won't be worshiping the beast? Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of the life of the Lamb who was slain. That's absolutely staggering. In many ways. I love the Bible. <laughs> I was pondering this morning in the bathroom. <laughs> My mind goes everywhere. <laughs> Think about legalists. Think about Twitter. Twitter. <laughs> and people that talk about legalism on Twitter. And, and, and Bible reading and devotions and pietism. And I thought, you know, the issue with regard to whether you read your Bible or not is not mainly a legal question of do I have to, but the really way, way more profound question of why wouldn't you want to? 
<laughs> That's the real question. That's the heart question. And, and this is a lot of guys going around making their living, dumping on legalism. When I'm thinking, you want to? <laughs> like, why are you developing this anti-legalistic rationale for you don't have to read your Bible once a day for half an hour or whatever? I say, but well, why would you even put it in those categories? Why would you even think like that? Why, why, why wouldn't you just raise the question, something wrong if you don't want to read your Bible? Something wrong with your soul if you like movies more than God's word. That's pretty damning for the evangelical church. But we protect ourselves immediately from that question. It's not legalism. It would be legalism. That's just changing the categories. It's just totally irrelevant. So all that to say, I love the Bible. This is awesome. This is incredible. I mean, look at verse 8. This is just off the charts better than any movie thriller. You just, you just have to believe it. You just have to see it. Not play with it. Not just skim over it off to breakfast. This is just off the charts. There's coming a beast. There's coming an antichrist. Everybody's going to bow down. Except one group of people. People whose names are in a book written before the universe existed. Why won't they be bowing down? Because that's what it means to be in the book. To be in the book is to be protected from the beast. You don't get your name in the book by not worshiping the beast. You don't worship the beast because your name is in the book. This is awesome. Is your name in the book? You don't put your name in the book. This is scary stuff. You either discover it's there by loving God and believing in Jesus, or you discover it's not there by being a worldly person and rejecting Jesus. My point here is the book has a name. It's called The Book of the Life of the Lamb Who Was Slain. That's the name of the book before the universe existed, which means there's going to be a slain lamb, which means there's going to be sin, a fall, a plan of redemption centering on the lamb. Jesus is awesome. Summary of this first half of the, of the line. Um, when I talk about gospel-centered history or Christ-centered history, <laughs> gospel-centered life, I mean at the center of history is Christ incarnate, God-man, sinless, didn't die for his own sins, died for the sins of others, finished the great work that was planned from eternity, purchased infinite grace for God's people, rose triumphant over sin and hell and death and Satan, ascended, reigns today, and from that point on now, that's where we're going in a minute, at that point, everything beforehand came to its consummation. Oh, how many more texts could be brought to bear? The goal of the law is Christ for righteousness. And many, many more.